Hi, everyone, and welcome to this session of the webinar of Philosophy of Psychiatry. Um, we are very pleased today and honored to welcome John Sadler, who is a psychiatrist, a distinguished professor in medical ethics, the director of the program in ethics in science and medicine, and chief of the division of ethics in the Department of Psychiatry of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He is co-founder and treasurer of the Association for the Advancement of Philosophy and Psychiatry, and he's on the executive board of the International Network of Philosophy and Psychiatry. Dr. Sadler is co-editor of Philosophy, Psychiatry, and Psychology, the Current Opinion in Psychiatry section on History and Philosophy, and the Oxford University Press book series, International Perspectives on Philosophy and Psychiatry. He has earned several teaching awards, and in 2014, he was designated a Distinguished Life Fellow for the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Sadler has edited or co-edited several books, several special issues of uh, professional journals, and authored many books and papers in the area of clinical research ethics, medical ethics, philosophy and ethics of psychiatry, and psychiatric education. He's notably the author of Values and Psychiatric Diagnosis, published in Oxford University Press in 2005, and co-author with philosopher Jennifer Radin of The Virtuous Psychiatrist, Character Ethics in Clinical Practice, published in 2010. Today, his talk is entitled Folk Metaphysical Assumption and the Generation of Formative Cultural Tropes in Mental Health and Criminal Justice. John Sadler, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah uh, and Anne-Marie. Uh, it's a, a real honor to, to be here today. I'm going to share my slides. Hopefully these look okay. How does that look? Fair enough? Very good. Yes. Uh, so right here, uh, the University of Texas, uh-oh. Functioning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can okay. hear you. I got an error message from Zoom, so God knows what happened. Uh, anyway, so this is a view of the UT Southwestern uh, uh, site. I want to mention my conflict of interest here with somewhat of a tongue in cheek. Uh, I'm a series editor and author for OUP with my annual royalties being in this stunning uh, range of the high three figures for your amusement. Um, academic publishing is not a highly profitable enterprise. So I'm my short title for my talk today is Rethinking Vice and Mental Illness. And I'll explain all here in the slides to come. Uh, I sort of saluted Jer Jeremy Bentham in some of the graphics here with the panopticon idea, which is very interesting if you all are not familiar, but it's a, another discussion in itself. I want to note that this presentation is a very brief sketch of some, but not all of the important themes from my upcoming 2023 book, Vice and Psychiatric Diagnosis, which uh, is a follow-up to my 2005 values in psychiatric diagnosis, which Sarah just mentioned. Um, the Vice book has been 15 years in the making, and I cannot possibly present all the details in the extensive history and argumentation featured, but I hope I can tantalize you with what I believe are some novel and important ideas today. So as a brief overview, I want to define what I mean by this problematic between vice and mental illness. I want to introduce the concept of uh, Western folk metaphysics and, and the assumptions around bad and bad. Uh, those of you in the philosophy of psychiatry uh, 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 community are probably familiar with that uh, expression. Um, I'll talk about uh, one of my major points and perhaps a maxim, which is our assumptions generate our problems. And then I'll talk about implications. 
Uh, John, sorry to interrupt. I think you're not on the presenter mode on your um, uh, with your PowerPoint. Well, my uh, my slides are advancing on my side. They're not here. I think you have to uh, click on the bottom right on the little um, icon that shows um, a, like a screen, a presenter screen. Well, let me stop the share and try again. Yes. So when you say Now you should see uh, the uh, problems and puzzle. I'm seeing quick. Okay, sorry everyone. Now, can you hear and see me? Yes. And so you should see as vice-laden diagnostic categories. Oh no. Oh yeah, now it's working. Now we are seeing um, your slide and- And it should say problems and puzzles. Yeah. It says That's problems good. and puzzles, That's great. So everything okay. is fine and you're in like full screen mode now. Okay, I'm gonna do one other thing. Oh, no. All right. So uh, so, so I'm going to back up a little bit. So here's the overview. Can you see that? Very good. Okay. So uh, to orient people, uh, Sarah mentioned uh, the Values in Psychiatric Diagnosis book. This was back in 2005. And it was basically an effort to trace out various kinds of value commitments, uh, both within DSM diagnostic categories on the one hand, and also uh, the uh, value laden processes of building a DSM on the other. This is now well familiar to this community, I would imagine, and many of you have uh, built on, on, on these efforts and interests. Uh, in the ensuing literature over the past, what, 18 years now. So uh, it's been very gratifying to see the, the explosion of interest in this uh, arena. Um, in that book, I define values uh, very briefly here as attitudes or dispositions to act, which are play, praiseworthy or blameworthy. Um, one of the, the broad conclusions is that DSM ICD categories are value laden in various ways, which will become very explicit as I go further into this talk. And one particular way is that some categories are vice laden, meaning that the values tied up in the diagnostic concept or criteria involve wrongful or criminal conduct. So what I call a vice refers to wrongful or criminal conduct. Um, and so it's not the ordinary language notion of vice as in vice squads, which you know arrest people that are doing uh, allegedly immoral things. So uh, distinction there. Uh, the vice laden categories among others that I talk about are antisocial personality disorder, conduct disorder, pedophilia now in DSM-5 pedophilic disorder, intermittent explode, explosive disorder among others, which, which uh, I won't go into at this point. So vice-laden diagnostic categories lend themselves to problems and puzzles. Um, one of these is, is that psychiatrists in the medical tradition view themselves as healers uh, and do not view themselves as arms of the police or the criminal justice system. Yet, when we have diagnostic categories involving uh, wrongful and criminal conduct, that distinction is uh, blurred uh, at best. Uh, the back, oh, 
five years or so ago, there was a big push in the American Psychiatric Association public relations rhetoric to call mental illness as a brain disease. Yet uh, we classify wrongdoers and criminal offenders as if they're diseased, um, which is seemingly uh, or is puzzling for many and sends uh, mixed messages. Vice-laden diagnosis uh, also intermingles with our, at least in the United States, simultaneously intrusive and neglectful social wel welfare efforts for the mentally ill, criminal offenders, intellectually disabled, and youth offenders. This is something I'll get into in much more detail later. And then uh, there are inconsistencies about what's included as vice-laden categories, official diagnoses of mental illness, and what aren't included. And so some of the omissions are some syndromic vice behaviors are classified as a mental disorder and others aren't. And so there are all kinds of syndromic or stereotypic uh, behaviors in the immoral and vice uh, or, or criminal realm. I've mentioned a few of these, murder, rape, white collar crime, and so forth. The question is, why don't these raise to the level of a disorder and uh, like, for example, antisocial personality disorder or conduct disorder is. So uh, some examples, again, briefly, antisocial personality disorder, criminal behavior is in the, beha in the criteria as well as conventionally wrongful and moral behavior, uh, lying, exploiting others, et cetera. Conduct disorder, if you look at the descriptive behavioral criteria, every single one of them is either uh, immoral or wrongful or criminal in content. It's a disorder that's defined by vice-laden uh, concepts. Intermittent explosive disorders characterized by abusive or violent outbursts. Uh, pedophilic disorder uh, and other what I call victimizing paraphilic disorders involves sexual victimization of others. And so other ones include things like exhibitionism or uh, fraturism, uh, nice uh, French connection there for, uh, for the, uh, um, the Montreal crowd. Um, other categories may include vice-laden descriptors, but these don't dominate the concept. And so a good example of this is inattention and disruptiveness. Uh, as a descriptor in ADHD. So with that sort of brief sketch about what the sort of uh, disorders I'm talking about, I now turn to uh, what I mean by folk and, and philosophical metaphysics and their associated assumptions. And so the lead in to this is the idea that vice-laden disorders uh, uh, are my way of casting the mad bad problem in psychiatry, which again, we'll talk more about uh, in the future. And so for these, uh, uh, to sort of get you thinking um, in this realm, I've given what, five examples of ordinary statements um, that then have uh, various sorts of uh, what I call folk metaphysical assumptions lurking therein. And so the first one is, I cannot be saved unless I accept Jesus in my heart. The second, John Hinckley's mental illness compelled his actions. By the way, John Hinckley is the young man from Dallas, Texas, uh, in the Reagan era who attempted to assassinate Reagan and was exonerated under the insanity defense many, uh, a couple of decades ago. Schizophrenia follows several causal pathways populated by genetic predispositions, environmental stressors, as well as interpersonal and lifestyle correlates. I have free will, but the devil made me do it. And then my last one, this creep deserves to die. So just to show or indicate that I'm not talking about anything too exotic here, the standard definition of metaphysics from the Cambridge Dictionary, uh, of Robert Audi, editor, most generally the philosophical investigation of the nature, constitution, and structure of reality. 
Uh, that said, academic philosophy typically splits metaphysics into two subdomains, epistemology or theory of knowledge and ontology, theory of being existence. This is going to be familiar to virtually everyone here. So let's look at those introductory uh, statements and how they harbor metaphysical assumptions. So I cannot be saved unless I accept Jesus in my heart. This uh, uh, assumes a theism, eternal life, faithful surrender, among others, for example. Uh, John Hinckley example uh, raises the issue of free will or the lack thereof. Um, schizophrenia, uh, the statement of a scientific nature around schizophrenia suggests natural and social causality as a, a metaphysical assumption. Uh, the free will, but the devil's influence suggests a supernatural causality. And then the creep deserves to die suggests that uh, uh, moral desert or, or uh, 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 worthiness for punishment uh, is involved in a, in a sort of metaphysical sense. So what I mean by folk and folk metaphysics is uh, uh, inspired by, but very distinct from the familiar concept in philosophy of folk psychology. Um, what I mean by folk metaphysical assumptions or beliefs uh, has to do with the ordinary assumptions that we harbor in our everyday life that are metaphysical in, uh, in substance. That is our everyday assumptions about the nature of reality. Um, so one might expect then, because these are deeply assumed that they would first of all be culture bound, which they of course are, they're oftentimes born in history, which I'm going to give you a flavor of how they uh, are uh, developed or evolved in history. Uh, they're non-systematic. And so if we go back one slide and look at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the free will, but the devil made me do it. Here's, the, here's in a contradiction. We have free will on the other hand and supernatural causality on the other, sort of contradicting free will. And that turns out to be very common with folk metaphysical assumptions that contradictions are harbored usually without, uh, without problems. And we really don't question them. And we'll see how this catches out later in problems in uh, psychiatry and mental health. I mentioned already that they're deeply assumed <clears throat> and they're also laden with uh, what uh, uh, I called in uh, values in psychiatric diagnosis, ontological values, which are uh, values that we live by and are invested in on an everyday basis, thereby making them very difficult to simply change. Um, and so for the next slide, I'll contrast with philosophical metaphysics, the typical examples being Hobbes, Kant, Descartes, Sartre, Heidegger, Hegel, among others. Um, so the idea in philosophical metaphysics is, is that uh, philosophers want to be systematic, comprehensive, and consistent in their formulations. They're explicitly theoretical in a way that folk metaphysics is not. It's in informal and casual. Uh, uh, philosophical metaphysics intends to be independent of culture and history, or has the ideal to be independent of cultural history, regardless of whether it's actually achieved or not. Assumptions are to be analyzed in critique critiqued in philosophical metaphysics and not simply taken for granted. Uh, and as we'll see later, that uh, critique of metaphysical assumptions is one of the fundamental activities of philosophy and especially important in philosophy and psychiatry and bioethics. It's not, not typically uh, implemented in everyday living or guide common sense. So, so while Hobbes may think uh, human nature is uh, uh, nasty, uh, brutish, short. In short, uh, that's not some 
typically the way I approach my everyday uh, approach to human problems. So further distinguishing folk and metaphys philosophical metaphysics, I mentioned earlier that identifying metaphysical assumptions is the stuff of philosophical critique of science as well as religion. Um, uh, the distinction constitutes portions of philosophical anthropology and practice. Uh, it's crucial to the analysis of assumptions in bioethics and philosophy and psychiatry. And oftentimes when, when I advise students if they want to get into uh, philosophy of psychiatry is to become facile in uh, identifying metaphysical assumptions as it's a great window into conceptual disputes in the field. So turning, uh, having hopefully clarified what I mean by folk metaphysical assumptions, uh, I wanna then talk about how uh, some of the current difficulties with the mad bad problem and vice laden uh, psychiatric concepts uh, evolved in the West uh, over in a historical sense. So I'm gonna be talking, starting with the enlightenment um, uh, or the more properly, the enlightenments is that it was very plural with, uh, uh, with multiple uh, transitions doing in various countries in uh, 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 Europe. So with the enlightenment, which I'm roughly uh, showing as 1500 to 1800, there was a growing departure from what I call Abrahamic religious me metaphysics, the Abrahamic religions being specifically Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Um, these uh, me folk metaphysical assumptions associated with Ab Abrahamic religions included free will, individual responsibility and moral desert. And I mentioned these specifically because they're of, of most interest for the, the, the issue of vice laden uh, diagnosis. Uh, during the enlightenment, uh, church influences were weakening as cultural uh, determinants in uh, Western Europe and later in uh, the American colonies. And uh, philosophy was starting to emerge with modern political theory uh, facilitated by Gutenberg's uh, discover or building of, of the printing press in the 1440s with subsequent printing of books and wider access to knowledge. Uh, the rise of secular cultural as the enlightenments went on uh, first appeared among the educated and wealthy elites, with, to use the currently popular uh, term of contention. Um, this represented the emergence of modern philosophy and science. Uh, it was also associated with the development of English and colonial common law, which become crucial to my discussion later. Uh, and rationality became a prevailing virtue over faith and submission to God. And as Foucault and others have, uh, have noted, uh, madness increasingly tended to be viewed as irrationality, since uh, rationality had now been elevated by the cultural trends of the Enlightenment. <clears throat> so again, over this period, as it progressed over those three centuries, there was a cultural shift in what I now am calling folk metaphysics. Uh, prior to the Enlightenments in the medieval era, for example, folk metaphysics of madness had been prevailingly magico-religious, that is, madness was a phenomenon associated with evil spirits uh, or punishment uh, or demon possession or punishment by God or the gods. A criminality uh, later grew out of uh, religious evil or sin uh, in the growing common law. And so this again reflected a shift to a more secular immorality with uh, uh, sin having increasingly more to do with personal wrongdoing, uh, including wrongful thinking, um, 
and uh, crime, the relatively new concept of crime was associated with uh, offenses against the people or the state. Uh, Western cultural began its fragmentation into what now in philosophy of psychiatry we call the mad bad problem. A particularly significant split uh, was represented in the faculty psychologies of notably Kant and Hobbes and others, which dominated the formulations of madness and the early alienists and later psychiatrists grouped uh, mental or madness into uh, disorders of cognition, motivation, and emotion, uh, oftentimes called conation and uh, affection respectively. These were assimilated into the emerging mad doctors, medicine, and proto-psychiatry. Um, the domain or faculty of morality was left to religion uh, and by an evolving secular common law, which retained the folk metaphysical concepts of free will, individual responsibility, and desert in handling crime and immorality. So scientific psychiatry, on the other hand, increasingly identified itself with a secular morality, claiming at some points a value-free folk metaphysics and developed complex and diverse causal explanatory scientific models for, scientific, for mental illness, which we now are quite familiar with today and, and are the basis of our uh, research endeavors in uh, mental disorders. The Anglo-American common and civil law maintained ties to Abrahamic folk metaphysics and built criminal law around the folk metaphysics of free will, individual responsibility and desert at its core. And so uh, these changes set the stage for confusing relationships between madness and badness and the mad bad problem uh, started to gel uh, in philosophy of psychiatry. Uh, Parallel with these changes, lay persons uh, diversified their folk metaphysical assumptions depending on an increasingly complex elaboration of Western culture. And so I think as the populations of the world uh, expand and as our ability to communicate with each other expands, there is just this general expansion and diversification of Western culture resulting in the subcultures we recognize today and leading to par contemporary paradoxes of folk metaphysics. For example, scientists who defend creationism or Christian psychiatrists, uh, that is psychiatrists who identify themselves as practicing uh, Christianity in a psychiatric form. By the end of the 20th century, uh, this is also interesting in that, again, remember that uh, one of the properties of folk metaphysical assumptions is that uh, contradictions are tolerated and ignored. So by the end of the 20th century, postmodern culture began to implicitly reflect this fragmentation of folk metaphysics through, for example, the culture wars, deconstruction um, in philosophy and similar phenomena. Folk metaphysics then through structuring our thinking was generative of these phenomena. So now back to mad bad, by the late 19th century, the distinct domains between moral or criminal and non-moral mad began to break down and become problematic in the early psychiatry. This, uh, this breakdown and these, these problem cases of badness and badness simultaneously uh, were stimulated by cases of the incomprehensible offender. So uh, beautifully described by Foucault's uh, monster concept in his uh, amalgam of his 1975-76 uh, lectures, Abnormal. It's a, it's one of the most readable Foucault collections I recommend it and it's probably under uh, appreciated. In uh, the USA, uh, James Pritchard and Benjamin Rush uh, uh, developed the concept of uh, moral insanity. Um, uh, similarly, one of the founding fathers of American forensic psychiatry, Isaac Ray, uh, 
articulated the idea of moral imbecility, that sort of intellectual disability analog, which, you know, as one might expect in a uh, sexist uh, uh, society was uh, mostly an affliction of women. Um, anyway, this was articulated again, blurring these distinctions between mad and bad. Uh, and then uh, uh, Jean Etienne Escaral in France uh, articulated his concept of monomanias, which uh, in, uh, in a very small way still appear in the DSM in the form of trichotillomania, pyromania, and kleptomania. We'll talk more about those here shortly. Um, uh, historian uh, Janet Colazzi in 1989, in a wonderful, fascinating book on uh, the concept of homicidal insanity in, in, uh, in the early psychiatry, uh, she uh, sketched out linea lineages of various vice-laden disorders. And, and for my book, I uh, adapted uh, Colazzi's uh, flow chart here, which I'm showing, um, and then elaborated on because her, her history basically st stopped with uh, the DSM era. And so I filled in the blank, so to speak, which is marked by the dotted line a horizontal line toward the bottom of the page. I can't go into all the details here. This is probably a lecture unto itself. Um, the idea is this phenomenon of homicidal insanity, that is insanity that drove murder, uh, is, which I mentioned earlier uh, from uh, Foucault's work uh, in description. Uh, was a source of enormous controversy within the, with the early alienists and later psychiatrists. And in keeping with the distinction between conation, cognition, and affection uh, uh, in terms of their faculty psychology, uh, it was argued back and forth amongst the alienists about whether homicidal insanity represented an intellectual insanity at the top of the page there, an emotional insanity or a volitional insanity. Um, and so the derivatives as we move through the, the decades uh, on listed down through the left see the, how uh, uh, murderous uh, madness then was uh, filtered, described, attempted to be classified. And notably, uh, the, in brackets, uh, they signify down, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder at the bottom of the page in brackets, central. Um, that represents when uh, the condition was explicitly dissociated from, from uh, being at risk for, uh, you know, anti-social uh, anti violent behavior. But it wasn't always so as you look up further is, is that it was thought to be associated with homicidal monomania, then became obsessive compulsive neurosis in the early 20th century and so forth. So again, uh, we may wanna return to this in the discussion period uh, if there's interest. So by the late 20th century, multiple disorders exhibit core DSM criteria that are largely wrongful or criminal in character. I mentioned all these and mentioned also pyromania and kleptomania. So it mixes the concept of illness bad with the concept of wrongdoing, uh, mad and bad, excuse me. So Thomas Zaz, and then in the early 60s, disputed the medical nature of mental illness, complaining that mental illness is simply responsible deviant conduct. Uh, and that if such conduct was harmful to others or otherwise illegal, it should be handled by the criminal justice system or preventatively by education or religion. It should not be, uh, so mental illness should not involve coercion as a Hungarian uh, uh, Jew surviving uh, the Nazi era. He was particularly concerned about the abuse of psychiatry and involuntary treatment. Zaz viewed uh, illness, mental illness as a myth or metaphorical disease. Zaz's work in philosophy and psychiatry, as you all know, was extremely influential. It led to a prominent theme in the 1980s, 
on forward to the present uh, that we try to resolve the mad bad problem. Though I contend it's still operating under the folk metaphysical confusions I have identified and therefore the mad bad problems solutions remain elusive. So more contemporaneously, uh, the mad and bad have been institutionalized into inchoate social welfare systems, particularly in the US. Uh, complicated by 50 different states with different rules, regulations, and practices involving mental health, adult and juvenile justice, and uh, formerly mental retardation, and now intellectual disability school systems. This enmeshment and lack of coordination contrib contributed to our current situation in the US that's simultaneously intrusive and neglectful in its social welfare. Uh, we're familiar with the excessive use of involuntary treatment. We're familiar with the failure of community or outpatient care. We're familiar with the homelessness problem and uh, the failure of domiciliary support. We talk about patients falling through the cracks and jails and prisons become major mental health service sites. The prison is a major source of mental health services. I'm sorry to say in the United States, we have the number one incarceration rate in the world and a widespread urban homeless mentally ill problem. Our social welfare systems can't seem to agree on a uniform folk metaphysics and therefore cannot develop a political philosophy subsequent to that, nor a public perspective for social welfare programs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our social welfare too often is based upon free will, individual desert and criminal justice system, while mental health science uh, and philosophy is more forgiving in a sense and challenging free will determinism and rejecting uh, uh, desert or lex uh, talionis concerns. In the US, these conflicts of folk metaphysics play out acutely in the forensic psychiatry where clinicians and lawyers duel over rival metaphysical accounts. We can talk a little bit more about this later if we have time. The public alternates between blaming criminals and the mentally ill and sympathizing with their circumstances. In the DSMs, we have categories which are both wrong conduct and disorder, that is the vice-laden disorders. How do we make sense of this? So going back to the history, I've made this table, which I call the enlightenment split about folk, around folk metaphysical assumptions and their derivative disciplinary specializations. And so during the medieval era, you know, roughly 1000 to 1600 AD, the view of madness was a demon possession or God's punishment. Social control mechanisms then were church and community. The view of well, uh, wrongdoing with sin, crime at this point hadn't been really invented yet, so to speak. Uh, but the view of wrongdoing was sin based and social control was oriented towards church and community. Again, uh, law as we know it had not yet been articulated. Um, in the Enlightenment era, the view of madness was of uh, sickness or disease, uh, a disturbance of nature. Social control was relegated to medicine. Uh, the methods of medicine were science, treatment, and prevention. The view of criminal wrongdoing, however, was of sin or failure of morality. The social control was the church, uh, and the methods then were worship, educations, and then threats of you know, eternal punishment and so forth. The Enlightenment split then. Uh, led to medicine inheriting madness explained by scientific causality and treated as disease while criminal and common law inherited wrongful conduct or sin which was explained by failure of faith or to resist temptation and treated as moral failing with punishment today popular culture mixes and matches and blends these in various ways uh, leading to the uh, very confusing uh, culture picture we grapple with today. So having now sketched out sort of the genesis of these issues, I now talk about uh, 
how they um, relate to particular issues in psychiatry and related to psychiatry and also the uh, criminal justice. How am I doing time-wise? I'm okay so far. So uh, thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, it, these are in no order of importance. First of all, I talk about the insanity defense or as it's called in the literature, uh, NGRI, not guilty by reason of insanity. So in criminal law, the folk metaphysical assumptions of individual responsibility desert, uh, that is punishment for wrongdoing. Uh, and in medicine and psychiatry, we think about complex multi-causal behavior, which diminishes or eliminates free will, uh, which of course then leads into the insanity defense dis dispute where uh, criminal law and medicine psychiatry are operating by from quite different sets of uh, folk metaphysical assumptions. In the public realm, demands for vengeance for violent offenders versus excuse and treatment for people qualifying for NGRI is part of the cultural debate. Uh, in actual practice, successful NGRI defenses are both uncommon and wildly inconsistent uh, in the sense of the justifiability and the criteria for a successful defense. Uh, the second spin-off issue is the, what I consider a core ethical problem within forensic psychiatry. And it's actually really simple. Uh, expert testimony in criminal trials subjects the defendant to potential harms. And these potential harms uh, violate a physician's first do no harm principle of medical ethics through subjecting the evaluee to risk of punishment. And so I would uh, suggest uh, that uh, forensic psychiatry not participate in uh, expert testimony for criminal trials because of this violating do no harm principle, analogous to psychiatrists participating in penal executions, which uh, at least the American Psychiatric Association is very public about uh, not uh, permitting. This problem could be eliminated if criminal justice was not subject to desert FM assumptions and therefore offenders were not punished but rehabilitated instead. Just to distinguish for clarity's sake, uh, a subfield of forensic psychiatry in the US is so-called correctional psychiatry, which is different in that its primary activity is providing uh, clinical care to prisoners in, in the correctional settings. So we have issues in the philosophy of psychiatry and mental health, as well as philosophy of psychopathology. And here, uh, the, this field makes no effort to distinguish disorders involving criminal offending from ordinary offending, which is very curious now with this different perspective of uh, folk metaphysical assumptions. Aside from a narrow group of vice-laden DSM disorders, criminal offending is simply assumed to be a moral failure rather than a complex causal disorder or non-disordered condition. Until the past 25 years, philosophers of psychology have failed to explore morality as a psychological faculty subject to disease or disorder. Now we have psychopathy as the premier example of a moral disorder, but is it the only one? I think that's pretty doubtful. So the question is, what are the others? Philosophy of psychopathology has made great strides in distinguishing disordered cognitions, emotions, and behaviors from non-disordered ones. Why not apply these skills in distinguishing between disordered and non-disordered morality? In terms of the mental health professions, the spinoffs, and include what I've already alluded to, which is we flip-flop between standpoints of complex multi-causality in psychiatry, on the one hand, and Abrahamic folk metaphysics of reason giving subject to punishment. We should pick a standpoint and stick to it in terms of social welfare policies. I would argue that scientific multi-causality and secular ethics is the folk metaphysical standpoint we should choose consistent with our medical morality described by Pellegrino as helping, healing, caring, and curing. 
regarding law and social policy, criminal justice policy in the USA is an amalgam of often severe punishment efforts, incarceration and execution, and typically feeble efforts at rehabilitation despite scientific, science studies indicating efficacy of well-designed, well-funded rehabilitation efforts. Prevention policies uh, regarding offending too often, or regarding reoffending, become too often or more politics than efficacy. The crime prevention and public health uh, remain separate, unequal, and underfunded. And instead, in my view, they should be collaborative and uh, generously funded. These tensions, political and application, reflect the confusion between the two FM standpoints. So regarding particular DSM disorders, under a consistent set of FM assumptions, the distinction between mad and bad dissipates because disorders of morality obviate the need to make the distinction. Unlike with mainstream distinctions between normality and psychopathology, the question with immoral actions shifts to normal versus disordered morality, a project for a new psychiatry, psychology, criminology, and philosophy. So interestingly, in DSM-5, uh, personality disorders are now uh, uh, no longer segregated into access to status and are just another set of mental disorders. One wonders if the vice content of these disorders is no longer as large a concern for the DSM authors. For vice-laden disorders under our current FM con confusions, these disorders is defined, set up motivations for patients to obscure, deny, or avoid diagnosis because of fear of Abrahamic punitive consequences. What would happen if punishment was removed from the equation regarding getting help for these conditions? So in closing, I'm gonna make a few prescriptions. Uh, many more are in the book and there's actually huge issues and portions of the book I've overlooked or omitted here. I uh, would like to suggest the nascent field of forensic criminology should replace forensic psychiatric expert tes testimony for the simple reason that criminologists have no professional stake in the welfare of alleged offenders, hence are not violating ethical duties by assisting courts in determining risk, state of mind, and diagnosis. We should rebuild, importantly, we should rehabilitate, not punish criminal offenders. The USA should work towards widespread use of restorative justice models instead of the current retributional or punishment oriented system. Restoration, for those who are not familiar with this concept, focuses on restoring victims as well as offenders through financial compensation, community service, apology, and rehabilitation. The public should be protected regardless from untreatable offenders through humane means of seclusion and monitoring, minimizing any punitive elements. Mental health professionals should be trained and aware of this idea of scientific complex causality and the FM assumptions of choice and bring research and care systems around these. Uh, these, I recognize these assumptions are not easily changed given that people build their lives around them. Uh, as with mental health professionals, the public will need education about the problems with retributional criminal justice and a punitive mindset based on desert. Philosophers of psychiatry and mental health should explore the conceptual boundaries of normal and disordered morality, just as they have done for normal and disordered emotions, cognitions, and motivation. Philosophers should reconceive responsibility, I'm almost done, <laughs> should reconceive responsibility apart from the presupposed metaphysical individualism characteristic of Abrahamic FM assumptions. The questions include, for example, what is choice in complex causal human science? Why is it under complex multi-causal metaphysics, we seem to have wide latitudes in choice in some contexts and in other contexts have much narrower latitudes. Clarifying these issues will aid clinicians, scientists in developing focused effective rehab programs. Mental health research and practice should fully commit to complex multi-causal FM assumptions, theorizing, 
with science, case formulation, treatment planning, and our colleagues in criminology should partner with us in the same way clinical psychology has with psychiatry for the past 100 plus years. Psychiatry and criminology should be accountable to the polity about what counts as pro-social, virtuous, and vicious behavior, build social policy to be transparent. Psychopathologists and nosologists should move the philosophy of disorder status as a central con consideration rather than as an afterthought. We should dismantle the silos and integrate social welfare efforts toward rehabilitating people with mental illness, juvenile criminal offenders, and intellectually disabled persons, many of whom oftentimes drift from service to service in an inchoate manner with the current status quo. Eliminating punishment and blame from our conceptual repertoire should reduce stigma and aid help seeking. We should rearrange federal funding priorities to augment all these changes. This concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention and patience. Thanks to uh, uh, Sarah and Anne Marie for the opportunity to do this. It's been an honor. I want to remind everyone of the app annual meeting. We have our poster here up. It's May 20, uh, 21st in San Francisco. You can get more uh, info from the website and my book there is, is being produced as we speak. So I've got some references left there for you if you want me to leave them up or I can take them down as y'all decide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you Thank very you. much, John Sadler.